How do you tell that a politician is lying? Their lips move. Two things to remember about career politicians. Most of them are lawyers, and if they were any good at being lawyers, then they would be in private practice. If con is the opposite of pro, then isn't Congress the opposite of progress? I'm not sure what the highest number in existence is, but I'm pretty sure that it's in the federal budget somewhere. Politicians are like diapers. Both need to be changed frequently and for the same reason. I don't like establishment politicians. Never have. Judging by the way many people react to any political news, I'm not alone in that. About the only thing useful that I get from most politicians is material for my videos. Nowhere are the problems with politicians better demonstrated than in Congress. So let's talk about the differences between what Congress is supposed to be, what it is, and what we can do about it. I believe for a long time now that if you want to hear three different answers to the same question, then you only need to ask a politician that question three times in three weeks. I wish that this was just a joke, but I'm afraid that it isn't. I've seen tapes and written statements from politicians which say a specific thing, then listen to the same politicians claim to be misquoted when asked about that statement later, or even to not have said it at all. When confronted with evidence that they have indeed said these things, they claim that the quote is out of context or even fake. If pinned down on a social media post, I've even seen them claim that their account was hacked or that they don't manage their own social media accounts. They refuse to accept personal responsibility for what is on their social media, and we certainly cannot expect media watchdogs and fact-checkers to call them out. Well, not if those politicians oppose certain other politicians whom journalists just don't like at all. A lot of focus has been placed on the White House and the first president to use social media to bypass journalists and get his message out directly to the people. Perhaps more focus should be placed on the 535 members of Congress instead. After all, there's at least as much material available from certain members of Congress as there was coming out of the White House, and collectively, much, much more. For that matter, maybe we should spend more time paying attention to what Congress is doing as well. After all, Congress is a co-equal branch of government, and with 535 voices all speaking, there's bound to be a lot more which deserves critical analysis. Despite decades of American high schools teaching American government and civics classes as a requirement for graduation, we still have an astonishing number of average Americans who don't seem to understand how Congress is supposed to work. Now, I've spoken before about how Congress is structured. Although I normally make such comments on Twitter in response to yet another person claiming that elected official X should do this or be expelled from Congress for doing that, or that the representation in Congress is biased against their interests because reasons. Usually the comments I make boil down to some version of, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. But responding to random users on Twitter isn't going to bridge the gap between what people should know about Congress and what they actually know about Congress. So, I'll explain it here and maybe help to build that bridge a little more efficiently. Congress has two houses. The Senate is the upper house and is comprised of two voting delegates from each state. The Senate has a few non-voting members like the chaplain and the sergeant at arms who assist the senators with everyday duties so that the elected members can concentrate on legislation. Senators are responsible for introducing legislation which doesn't involve spending federal funds approving legislation which does involve spending federal money, approving presidential appointments, ratifying treaties, conducting the trial during impeachment proceedings, and a selection of other minor or rarely invoked duties. But, and this is one of the most common misconceptions which I correct on Twitter, the senators are not elected to represent the interests of the people of their state directly. The Constitution makes it clear that senators represent the interests of their respective states. That may seem a subtle distinction, but it really isn't. Each state gets two senators, no more or less, no matter how big or small the state is, or how big or small the population of that state is. This gives equal representation to each state in the Senate as a hedge against more populous states enforcing their will on less populous states. When the first Congress convened, the most populous state was Virginia, who supplied 10 of the 59 delegates to the House. 
Virginia remained the largest delegation to the House for 24 years, after which New York became the most populous state. New York held that position as the most powerful state in the House for 160 years, at which time they lost that position to California, who has held it ever since, and probably will until they yield it to Texas. And for all of that time, despite the fact that the most populous state had at least nine more delegates in the House than the least populous state, each state had equal representation in the Senate. The point behind doing this is divided sovereignty. The federal government has sovereignty over the country as a whole, but each state also has sovereignty and powers reserved to it, and the people as a whole have sovereignty as well in the form of natural rights and privileges guaranteed to them by the Constitution as well as that right to vote. The United States as a whole has one elected representative, the President, whose individual authority is equal to that of the collective authority of Congress. Each state gets two elected representatives. Their senators. The people get 435 representatives in total, apportioned by population, their representatives. And as for the Constitution, as the supreme law of the land, it also gets representation in the form of nine Supreme Court justices, whose collective authority is equal to that of the President or the collective authority of Congress. If there is a vacancy in the Senate, in most cases the governor of that state appoints a temporary replacement. The 17th Amendment requires that Senate vacancies be filled by special election, but leaves the manner in which the special election is conducted to the states. 36 states allow such appointments and conduct that election at the next biennial general election. Nine states allow such appointments but conduct a special election on an accelerated schedule. And five states simply bypass the temporary appointment and conduct a special election to fill the vacant seat immediately. Under normal circumstances, however, senators are elected to six-year terms, with roughly a third of the Senate seats elected every two years. Those longer terms are part of the nature of the Senate as a more deliberative body in Congress. The Founding Fathers intended that the Senate should not be as subject to political pressure as the House is. What actually obtains, though, is that the Senate is where legislation goes to die or be maimed. Very few bills in the history of the country have been passed by the Senate without amendments, and many bills never make it to a floor vote. Even if those bills were already passed by the House in response to popular sentiment and pressing need. This was meant to allow cooler heads to prevail in the face of an inflamed electorate so that the Congress was not perpetually passing bad laws and then having to repeal them. What happens, though, is that the Senate has made a habit of refusing to address important issues. They also make a habit of suggesting that the president doesn't understand the will of the people, that the people don't understand the needs of the nation, and that the House is too prone to overreach. The House, on the other hand, is filled with 435 voting members elected every other year. Joining them are six non-voting members, one from each of the U.S. territories and one from the District of Columbia. The House also has a group of non-member officials who perform supporting duties, just as the Senate does. The House was intended to be as sensitive to public opinion as the Senate is insensitive to it. Each representative is meant to serve the members of their district, not their state. That's why the Constitution also established that they should face elections every two years, at the time reasoning that two years was long enough to get a lot done and still be able to campaign for re-election. Every election also serves as a referendum on the service of those elected officials. So a representative that didn't do anything for their district should, in theory, be ousted in favor of someone who will serve their constituents properly. If there is a vacancy, then a special election is held in that district. If, however, a general election is upcoming later that year, then the district may choose to wait until the general election, because there isn't much sense in having a special election a couple of months before the general election. The House serves as the principal venue for introducing legislation. While legislation can be introduced in the Senate, any legislation that involves raising revenues has to originate in the House by constitutional law. So by tradition, all appropriations start in the House, and nearly every bill involves at least some appropriations. That's a pretty big chunk of power, too, because if the House doesn't introduce a bill which would raise or spend federal money, then the Senate normally won't introduce it, and the Senate cannot introduce a tax bill at all. What actually happens is that the House is strictly divided along party lines and rarely works together meaning that any issue which is red meat to the House Majority Party is likely to get a bill about it passed and sent to the Senate. It means that the Speaker of the House will constantly remind a president elected from the other party that the president doesn't run the world. The members will work out compromise bills with the White House without consulting the Senate, 
and that the Senate will be blamed for any delays in passage of those compromise bills. It also means that the members of Congress will tell their constituents that the President doesn't understand the needs of regular Americans, and the only solution is to make sure that Congress and the White House are both in the hands of the Speaker's party. Within the constitutional framework for Congress, the Founders believed that the voices of the people and the will of the states would be heard and promoted. They knew that there would be a debate, and they knew that sometimes there just wouldn't be a compromise. But by and large, the framework is supposed to encourage compromise. Both sides of every issue come together and find a middle ground, and that middle ground is the legislation which they then propose and pass. But politicians are politicians, and the founders may not have expected the formation of massive, organized national political parties. The framework of the Congress was based in part on the British parliamentary system, and Parliament has many parties, not just two. What's more, shifting alliances among the parties in Parliament emphasize the need for compromise, whereas the two-party system which dominates American politics doesn't foster compromise at all. The United States has a much more adversarial system, with the major parties dominating congressional politics entirely. Every vote and every measure is another test of party strength, and both parties are working towards their ultimate goal of gaining control of the government. Look at the past few years, because we can see this in action. Both the GOP and the Dems are focused on the control of the White House, along with increasing their membership in each House of Congress until a supermajority exists. If the Senate has 67 members from one party, the House has 290 members from the same party, and that party also holds the Oval Office, then there are only three ways to stop that party from forcing through their agenda. The voters can get them out of office through elections, the states can refuse to ratify any constitutional amendments that they pass, or the judiciary can rule their laws unconstitutional when they are challenged in court. But the voters will have to wait until those elections are called. The states will only be able to reject constitutional amendments, not laws, and those judges who rule legislation unconstitutional could find themselves impeached, convicted, and removed. Yes, I said impeached. This is a political process which is easily weaponized. Not even the Supreme Court will interfere, either, as the Constitution grants the power of impeachment solely to Congress, and SCOTUS has already ruled that impeachment is not a legal process subject to judicial review. Even if impeachment doesn't happen, Congress could simply pass laws to increase the number of federal judges, even Supreme Court justices, in order to tip the balance of power to their side. With those majorities, they could also vote to expel members of Congress for political wrongthink, too. That's why both parties want that power and are willing to fight hard to get it. This is what actually obtains in Congress now, and has for quite some time, the perpetual battle for the balance of power. The Dems have the upper hand at the moment by a thin margin through holding both houses of Congress and the Oval Office. While the President faces term limits, Congress does not, and can stay in power so long as they can keep winning elections. The Dems can keep pushing through their agenda so long as they maintain party discipline. In time, they could potentially erode enough support for GOP members that they gain those veto-proof supermajorities. And if they do, the entire system of government in the United States is at risk of failing. In all honesty, that scenario is also possible if the GOP gains that position. But the GOP is conservative. Their platform isn't built on sweeping changes anymore, and hasn't been since Reconstruction. It's built on maintaining the status quo or reversing the sweeping changes enacted by the Democrats. It's still an exercise in power, but one based on keeping things roughly the same as they have been in the past. The risk is therefore a little bit lower. But in either scenario, one party would effectively rule the country from Washington, dictating what will be to the states and constituents that they are supposed to represent. That will leave them with a pressing need to placate the people, who will in turn reign in the state governments. And the best way to placate the masses is money. The American Republic will endure until the day Congress discovers that it can bribe the public with the public's money. While Alexis de Tocqueville may have said this, or it could have been Alexander Fraser Teitler, or perhaps it was even Elmer T. Peterson, it's still a statement which raises concern, because it's possible that Congress could do this. The definition of the historical cycle provided by Henning W. Prentice Jr. is also worrisome. The historical cycle seems to be from bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to courage, from courage to freedom, from freedom to abundance, from abundance to selfishness, from selfishness to complacency, from complacency to apathy, from apathy to fear, from fear to dependency, 
and from dependency back to bondage once more. If fear provokes us into granting supermajority power to just one political party, then that party will quickly realize that they can maintain their power through creating dependency, and they will have access to the means for fostering that dependency using the federal budget. From there, it's but a short journey through oligarchy to tyranny. The best solution is to maintain a balance of power in Congress. We need for the politicians to be forced to work together, and we cannot do that if we keep voting for fear-mongering liars. We have to take a nonpartisan approach to this, too. When we catch a politician in their lies, then we need to call them out for lying, whether it's a claim that they did something or a claim that they didn't do it. We need to reject their fear-mongering, whether it's about climate change or insurrection. We need to identify those people who pit us against each other and vote them right out of office. We need to show every last one of those elected officials that we are tired of them promising us the moon and then blaming the other side for not being able to deliver it. And we need to do this without rioting, partly because rioting is harmful, but also because rioting gives politicians a perfect opportunity to ignore the issues the people raise and to use the harm done as ammunition in their never-ending battle for power amongst themselves. Every broken window, every burning building, Every spray-painted wall and every threat made is not just a crime. It's a weapon which politicians will use against each other and against us. No, we do this at the voting booth, in coffee shops, in schools, in chat rooms, and in social media threads. We do this by educating ourselves on the issues instead of accepting whatever we are told by politicians and journalists as gospel. We do this by watching carefully just what the current political arguments are, testing them with common sense, and rejecting lies and fear-mongering. We do this by exercising the sovereignty that we, the people of the United States, have by natural right and under constitutional law. We do this by calling our elected officials, emailing them, responding to them on social media, writing letters to them, making videos about what is going on and what they should do about it, publishing news reports watched by them and articles read by them, and otherwise peacefully, and only peacefully, assembling to petition them for redress of grievances. We do this by setting aside party differences and rancor amongst ourselves, and having real discussions with each other about the issues like our elected officials should be doing. We do this by realizing that the person on the other side of an issue is a real human being too, who has real concerns and the same constitutional right to voice those concerns as we do. We have to do this. It's our duty as citizens of the United States. The Constitution guarantees our natural rights, but the Constitution derives its power from us because it belongs to us, collectively. And we, collectively, have to protect it as well, because you can guess what politicians will do if we don't.